G'day guys, welcome to another episode of Hash It Out. In today's episode, we're going to be discussing privacy. So joining once again, we have Armenio and Noah. Welcome, gents. How's it going, guys? Good to be here. Yeah, it's uh, another week, another eventful uh, week in the crypto industry once again. Um, and then so we thought we'd sort of touch on privacy. I think, uh, where do you want to kick things off? This Privacy is a pretty broad topic and uh, there's multiple, multiple layers to privacy. So I think, uh, do you want to kick things off at a higher level and sort of sure. uh, dive, dive into the nitty gritty? Sure, I, I'll jump on that uh, to start. You know, I, I think that privacy is probably going to be a defining issue uh, in an increasingly digital world, right? And the question breaks down to space, just that simple space. Like, do you have the ability to store your own information in your own space without having someone else come uh, manipulate or control that, right? And, you know, decentralization is, is a fascinating concept because I often call it collective localization, right? It's yeah. like you are in charge of your own space, but we all are collectively and we work together for some common purpose or goal. Um, now, I know that uh, privacy is not always, uh, uh, let's say, widely acceptable in broader society as a concept yeah. but you know it's all, I, it always breaks down to like you hear oh well you know if you have nothing to fear you have nothing to hide and in my opinion that's the wrong even concept it's like if it's my space it's not about hiding anything from you because it's my space right well you often um, hear that um the term say i've got nothing to hide so why do i have to have privacy in my life or even in personal life or online sort of um, identity and things like that um and, and it just goes to show uh, or ties into what you just mentioned there yeah and the whole uh have nothing to hide argument kind of breaks down you know that that's fair most of the time until it's not and when it's not it's really not you know uh, and it becomes not when, for example, like your government decides that, uh, you know, something you're doing is illegal that beforehand wasn't, um, yeah. So just from like a, a high level philosophical level, uh, I think privacy is under appreciated in its importance for that reason. Yeah, most definitely. And it can tie across multiple aspects as well. So um, you tie it into what you mentioned about space and even like you've got the big sort of Web2 giants that are collect your data and sell it and trade it and all that sort of stuff. It might not have an actual name attached to it, but they've built a massive profile around what you do, how you do it, when you do it, and they can target um different bits and different uh, marketing aspects or anything that as such. So obviously they may not have a name or they will have a name, but it might not be tied to your name personally. So to have something uh, to be able to sort of break that barrier, take self-custody of all that data, but then also financial privacy as well. You want to be able to say, go and buy a chocolate bar with a $20 note or something and then not have anyone know what chocolate bar you bought. Um, having that fungibility across every, all platforms of your life is massive. Yeah, when you, when you get into Web 2, the reality is users don't even understand the um, assumptions that they're taking on and, and what they're inviting, to be honest. It, you know, usually you sign up for something and you get hit with a user agreement. That <laughs> yeah. <has> got <laughs> how long, you know, it's too long, didn't read in practice, right? And it's, yeah. it's in my opinion, it's purposely, uh, you know, if you were to sit someone down and say, okay, I'm going to explain it to you like you're five. This is what you're inviting into your space. This is what you're giving away. And let's think about what could potentially happen because the thing about privacy is once something is revealed, good luck getting it uh, you know, back in <laughs> that box that it was revealed from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, most definitely. And that's massive as well. Like, uh, like Noel was saying, it's, it's all well and good until the tables are turned and the, the goalposts are moved and who knows what sort of um, yeah. uh, legislation could come into play or anything at any stage. And if it's um, 
they've already built this profile around you. That's yeah, it's not a good look. Yeah. So transitioning to Web three stuff now, uh, it's it's kind of funny because in a way, uh, blockchain is the least anonymous <laughs> it, it, most of the time. You know, there's a ledger for everything going on. Um, so how, how does privacy tie into blockchain and cryptocurrency and cryptography and all of that? Sure. So, um, you know, a part of the transparency is to get people to run a common uh, architecture in their own space and trust each other in a trustless mm -hmm. way. Right. Mm -hmm. that, that's actually quite important. You, you have like the public infrastructure side. Right. So that open ledger. Um, and open code in the ledger kind of allows you to bring something into your space and have, you know, like a common trust assumption. It's, it's, it's interesting in a way, if you were to demonetize uh, decentralized networks, you know, it's almost like you're choosing to be a citizen in this uh, digital society. Right. And, you know, the core component of that is in joining um, the assumptions of membership are open. All the code is open, right? That's how Bitcoin was founded. That's how Ergo was founded. And so even if Noah directly, you know, can't understand like what all the assumptions are, he can also know that there are other actors in the network that are running the same open source code. And so to some degree, it's like relying on the general public trust. Now, is that always perfect? No, sometimes it's a little messy. There's a bug here or there. And usually the collective uh, society fixes it, right? But having that transparency to be able to bring something into your space and uh, trust it in your space is, is actually probably the core uh, component of what makes decentralization possible. Yeah, so you build that trustless layer or trusted trustless layer, let's say, but then also mm -hmm. to be able to have the ability just to be able to release certain aspects of information at your will. That's uh, that's a massive um, advantage, I believe, so for the uh, Web3 side of things, so di digital IDs and things like that. So you take ownership of all your identity and you just release out what you want at certain periods of time. It's like you're... Uh manually consenting to opt in to control over whatever you're putting out there rather than <laughs> signing the 50 page agreement <laughs> and who knows what they take you're 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 giving away your privacy by invitation right yeah. right you choose what to reveal um and and that's actually quite important you know if last week we talked about what is decentralization in terms of dApps and it's the same concept in a way like if i'm going to bring a decentralized application into my space i need open source code so i can create that distributed trust environment and i can interact with it without asking anybody's permission or having any choke point that i have to go through their server or uh, whatever their infrastructure is to be able to interact with it because you know suddenly then you do have a third party even if you know it's uh you know like uh, doesn't have a face to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So on that, you've got the ability to be totally anonymous and then have a pseudo anonymity sort of thing. I do that sort of with CW and uh, um, of people know me, but it's also at a, uh, as like a pseudonym as well of my identity. Um, being able to release different aspects of that, I think it's really, really great to be able to do so. Um, you did mention that uh, allowing dApps into your space and, and um, inter inter interacting with the blockchain. Um, obviously, Ergo has a concept around privacy and the interactions there. Uh, Ergo is not a privacy coin, but it allows privacy interactions with um, the Ergo mixer. Can you elaborate on that? Sure. So the most important part of the Ergo mixer is that it is permissionless. Okay. And, and that's one thing where most people in life have to, uh, let's say, reveal private information in order to get permission to do something. You know, you know now it depends on what and, you know, why, why and where that makes sense. But that's often where we start to 
give away privacy uh, by invitation. So, you know, a non-interactive application um, requires no party's permission to use. So the Ergo Mixer itself is ran locally in your space and it's fully open source, which gives you, uh, you know, kind of the distributed assumption that, okay, everybody is, that has used it, there hasn't been problems. You can review the code a lot of uh, developers have. Now, how does uh, that particular uh, application works? It works with the Diffie-Hellman um, proof of common knowledge. And if I were to try to explain that to you like you're five, right? Yes, please. <laughs> please. <laughs> I'll do my best. So basically, on top of Ergo, there is a calculator, right? And all that calculator does is prove a, let's say, common knowledge uh, based on someone's keys. Now, the, the actual math involved, you can't explain to a five. <laughs> sure. Right. That's fine. But that's just way above. That's just way going to be a way above their potential. For okay, there's maybe some genius five year olds out there, but <laughs> but uh, you know, for for the layman, let's say that uh, you know you want to create uh, that type of uh, signature on Ergo, you use that calculator to prove common knowledge between two participants, and so it's non custodial. It's non interactive. You're just using a common piece of code uh, that is programmed on top of the Ergo blockchain uh, to prove that basically you two can trust each other because common knowledge has been found. And it, it literally is just a calculator. So the swap between, say, null or an I, we always have custody of our coins, but... Mm -hmm. From an outside observer, they don't know who is spending those transactions. Yeah, you wouldn't be able to tell which address of the two was the one that actually approved it, so to speak. Yeah. So it, it's kind of like two people um, walk into the room, but uh, you can't really see who is walking out. It should be noted that... Um you know, your anonymity is only as good as you make it, right? So if you interact with the mixer and then from that anonymous address, you send it back to your non-anonymous address, like <laughs> it's it's pointless. So, you know, there's, there's, you have to be careful if you're trying to remain anonymous, making sure that you don't leave breadcrumbs behind for other people to find. That ties yeah, there's into a another feature, um, stealth addresses. Yeah, uh, what on what Noah was saying, even something like, let's say I decide to mix coins and then I decide to tip Noah, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like after that, you know, that could potentially be a problem because, you know, especially if I did it on the um, social media channel, it's, it's coming from me. Mm -hmm. So he's going to be able to easily connect the identity and the address. And I'm not saying don't tip anyone, but I'm saying that's an assumption you should think about. Right. Um, it's it's the assumption. Yeah, try to keep your address and your identity separate if privacy is important to you. If it's not, you know, okay, enjoy mm -hmm. life. Don't worry about <laughs> it. Yeah. <laughs> Put your face out onto the internet for everyone to see. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, that's where I am now. Okay. Uh, anyway, so what was your yeah. question, Steve? Of you, I got I got. I think it was about stealth addresses. Oh, so being uh, able to pay out of the ergo mixer like Noah was just saying you don't want to pay out into a known address um you want to do something and uh keep it sort of private as well but then an, an, an ability to be, for the mixer is to be able to um, withdraw to a stealth address uh, can you elaborate on what that actually is sure so a stealth address is like a common address um you could almost look at it like a pool okay um I'll try to explain it to you like you're five. Let's say you have a swimming swimming pool with a bunch of people that you know they jumped into it, right? But then when when they pull out of it or they get out of the pool, they have a new address. And so it's it's still kind of the same concept of uh, trying to uh, obfuscate by using the masses, right? Mm -hmm. Or using another party. Um, 
Now that particular thing does use a ring signature to connect the um, address to, let's say from NOAA to CW in that pool itself, but it's using kind of a common address to hide in collectively. And so you can see who jumps in, but then when they jump out, they have a new address and you, you can't really uh, tell. Yeah, so you don't know how much money or how many coins ERG or even native tokens for that matter. Um, the, it should be noted that the ERGO mixer can mix any token on the ERGO blockchain. Um, but then also they don't know how many they have in, in their custody, but then also where they're withdrawing that to. I think that's massive for the industry. Yeah, optional privacy is important. I, I really do think that uh, probably in the next decade, that's going to be a defining issue globally. Um, you know, we, we've advanced uh, enough technically that, you know, yeah, we're all on camera and mic right now, but we're constantly, you know, surveilled, watched, <laughs> tracked, web scraped, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and so I guess collectively we need to make a choice. Like if I'm going to be a citizen of the internet by choice, uh, what level of space am I going to demand? Right. And, and it, it does, you know, kind of, yeah, I guess you hear the, the word thrown around digital property, right? Yeah. If it's your digital property, is it your private property or is it more of a common public property? You know, the, your house is, is a kind of a good example of that. We have, you know, at least uh, in the United States, a pretty uh, well um understood concept that this is my personal space right yeah. uh, you know mm -hmm. certainly you can invite someone in you know by invitation and reveal whatever you want but uh there's a certain notion that okay that is theirs and it's something that uh people have the right to have and the right to defend and you know it, it's well understood but when you get into like digital property uh things change a lot yeah, it's a big gray area. So your thoughts, um, there's been some chatter around the European Union actually in implementing um, or outlawing custodial wallets. I think that's a massive oh, sort yeah. of, um, intrusion into privacy. Um, what are your thoughts on that? How, how could that be implemented? Well, well <laughs> I'll just say real quick. I'll just say real quick. Uh, It'll just make privacy that much more important, I think. Yeah. Well, the, I, go reality ahead. Go ahead. Is, the reality is in terms of like financial uh, privacy and financial transactions, that's been a noose that's been tightening for a while, in my opinion, where, you know, they got rid of the 500 euro note and you have a lot of societies that are moving cash lists and cash is peer-to-peer uh, -peer money, right? It does have privacy attached to it, does have fungibility attached to it. And there's a certain uh, assumption that if it's in your pocket, it's yours. Right? Well, that ties into something I was just about to bring up as well is CBDCs um, and the possible ability for those to be programmed. Um, it basically makes the token um, or takes the fungibility away, I would say, um, only being able to sort of say, Noah's only allowed to buy product X and Armenia is only allowed to buy product Y for whatever reason, depending on their jurisdiction or um, their class level or anything like that. I think that could be a really scary um, sort of uh, uh, development in that space. Yeah, it's the weaponization of money. I, yeah, I, think, uh, I think. What was that? I said at that point, I don't even think it's money. I think it's, it's like a coupon. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You're, you're totally right. Yep. Yeah, coupon is it's pretty apt. So it's well, a, scary a coupon with a gun on. attached to it. <laughs> yeah, it's a digital ration card. I mean, call yeah. it what it is. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, the reality is our digital systems are becoming advanced enough. I don't know if we've reached the threshold, but I think in my lifetime, there will be the capacity that, uh, you know, a person can be born in a developed society and every penny they touch for their entire life is tracked stored traceable um that's a frightening thought right i i hope that uh, the world does not move in that direction and 
um, you know, we have the ability to say, okay, well, this is my uh, financial space and I can make decisions for myself that are my business, right? It's not that I have nothing to hide. It's just, that's not your goddamn business. Yeah. Uh, you very know, well put. Yeah. What medication I buy or what clothes I buy or what my vices are, or, you know, what my spending habits are. Um, that's my business, right? That's, that's not yours. And as soon as you make that like a common, uh, I don't know, common information, how many people are then going to try to control and force their beliefs on other people? Yeah, or not even a common information, but information that only a privileged group of people can have, yeah. you know, that, that creates power. And that's terrifying. If, if a certain group of people know everything about one another group, but the other group doesn't know, you know, it's, it's terrifying. That's dystopian, it, you know. And I, I think what um, part of, you know, there's a lot of things that attracted me to Ergo, even though it's not specifically a privacy coin, but the ability to um, have those privacy interactions, like you said, CW. Like, right now, this is all kind of hypotheticals. Um, even though the news is tightening. Um, but it, it, it is easy <clears throat> to imagine a world where this stuff is real. And I, it, it's, I do. yeah, it's scary. Go ahead. That's actually one of the biggest benefits of proof of work. That's like yeah. never, never really fully appreciated in my opinion. Um, if I locally run proof of work, right? and I mine to a wallet address that I created the keys for. I come into that system without uh, my identity attached to my wallet. It's yeah. a KYC list, permissionless entry into the market. And that's huge. Like we can say, okay, well, from a first world perspective, maybe that doesn't matter, right? But uh, if you're talking about an environment that's hostile, that is a huge benefit. Massive, mm -hmm. you know, versus if I want to have a proof of stake system, I either need to have pre-existing crypto or I have to use an exchange infrastructure that usually requires my identity uh, or I have to go back and mine proof of work to get into crypto. Right. Mm -hmm. Like that. Uh, there are some, you know, very small use cases where, you know, you have like uh, lazy mint NFTs and things like that, but they could never support the user base. And, and the amount of uh, people that, you know, proof of work provides that benefit to. So even aside from like the energy debate that's always floating <laughs> around out there, uh, having, you know, the ability to interact, uh, you know, in crypto without giving your identity makes a hell of a lot of sense. Yeah, that's exactly mm -hmm. what I was just about to sort of elaborate on as well is I think that's where a lot of FUD uh, sort of comes from is outlaw or wanting to outlaw proof of work under the guise of energy consumption because ultimately anyone can participate on a proof of work network uh, by mining and that you have got that uh, limitless uh, um, you don't have that KYC ability, whereas if you have to uh, participate on a proof of state network, like you mentioned, you have to go through an exchange or a P2P sort of scenario or something like that, where your identity is basically given up. Proof of work, you can jump into anywhere and start from zero. It's great. Yeah, yeah the KYC know. thing. Uh, the the KYC thing is pretty pretty scary too with exchanges, um, especially in the US. Things are getting much stricter here. Um, and I know, I think it was in Denmark, maybe in the last month or two, uh, I saw something that Coinbase is requiring you to list the like name and address, like yeah, the residential receiver. address of the receiver of like outgoing withdrawals from Coinbase in that country, which that is terrifying, man. Like <laughs> that, that's KYC well, just, on another level. That's just a terrible idea. That's <laughs> yeah. a terrible yeah. idea. That that yeah. list gets leaked, and guess what? Some people are probably going to get kidnapped. Like good old wrench attack. Exactly the five dollar wrench attack. But like, 
it goes into the what you're saying about the space. Like I know you two gentlemen, not onto the the personal level where I want to know your address or anything like that. Like say I want to send you some funds, fair enough, that's no dramas, but I don't need to know where you live and what you do or any profession like that or you know what I mean? Like that's just overstepping the boundary. Well, yeah. it's important that people recognize they should not have to ask permission to have space, right? Like that in and of itself, I think it is problematic when people have this perception they need to have permission to have privacy. <laughs> it defeats the point. Um, mm-hmm. You know, so I, in my opinion, that's a basic right and it should be a digital right. And uh, honestly, the if there's like one thing that is worse than some of the crypto marketing out there, it's probably the user assumptions in Web2 in terms of privacy and, and what you're actually giving away. Yeah. Yeah, well, you I sign think, up uh, to all these services and like I said, you go through and you sign the 500 page document and just do the checkbox and go, okay, and away you go. And like you've got these massive Web2 companies like Meta or Facebook, whatever you want to call them, Google, et cetera, Apple, and you basically dump your entire identity onto these networks. Um, your, your photos, personal data, um, you can even put all your financial data in there. So they've basically you've got a, an overview of your entire life and your connections, your family and everything like that as well. Yeah, I think it can kind of be boiled down to if the service that you're using is free, you're the product most likely. <laughs> like they, they're they selling you and your information because it's valuable to advertisers and, you know, who, who, who knows? Uh, I've heard of sketchy things happening with sold information and, you know, that stuff is at risk of hacks and bad, really bad things can happen. Um, Look at Afghanistan as a perfect example, right? Taliban takes over. What's the first thing they do? They look on Facebook and Instagram for people that disagree with them or don't agree with their religious code and they try to exterminate them. That's like an extreme example. But, you know, the reality is, uh, you know, we're lucky enough to live in stable societies. But if you lived in a society that's truly unstable, um, you know, privacy can mean life or death. Yeah, it's true. The uh, the Web2 thing. Uh, I know Apple is frustrating in a lot of ways uh, with with privacy and everything else. But one thing that I, I do appreciate about their their phones is that anytime you open a new app or something, it'll it'll tell you that it's trying to track your information and it allows you to opt out or opt in. Um, it's kind of bringing attention to the assumptions that we were talking about before and um, having, having that visibility, I think is a really powerful thing. you know, for the longest time, I think people didn't even think about it. And then as soon as this little pop-up shows up, it, it sort of like, you know, flips the switch in your brain, like, huh, like, what is that? Should I be concerned about that? Yeah, for instance, you install a calculator or something like that and it wants to access your contacts. Yeah. It's got absolutely no right to be in your contacts. Like, why would it want to be there? You know what I mean? Like little things like that. And it's, yeah, it's yeah. like, I mean, it was saying you control your space and, and what you want access to be, or what you want to be able to provide access to. Um, mm-hmm. So moving back into the blockchain side of things, like I mentioned earlier, Ergo has um, optional privacy, but then there's also... 100% private coins as well, which are enforced by the protocol. Um, what's the difference between sort of optional privacy and that forced privacy? Oh, there's a couple of trade-offs that sometimes uh, pop up. Um, you know, I'll, I'll use just like some historical examples, right? Uh, one is supply auditability, right? If you don't know, you know, who has how much, you can't scan the blockchain and see what the total coins in existence are and that Mm. could be a problem if someone uh figures out you know how to exploit that and in some cases that has been a problem Mm. um you know and suddenly you get a lot of complexity in terms of uh some basic infrastructure like multi-sig is is more difficult to create uh in that environment Uh, it just creates a lot of functionality limitations or complications that you know, maybe they can be solved, but 
Uh, the other thing is they also can be quite heavy uh, because you have pretty complex cryptography and everything, uh, you know, the size, you know, becomes a bigger factor uh, just in terms of like uh, the raw space uh, it takes. So there are some, there are some definite uh, limitations in terms of um, privacy. Now that's something that actually there's been some pretty nice progress on, you know, uh, Apache, uh, is somewhat interesting uh, over on Ethereum that roll up, uh, you know, uh, Zcash, uh, Halo is is a pretty interesting build in, in terms of zero knowledge proofs. So, you know, that is something that I, I do think, you know, zero knowledge proofs um, actually have a huge use case, but it's really, really early. And you get super complex math that uh, I would say... don't understand. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 one of those things where it's like, okay, the the benefits are are huge, right? Uh, but it's a really foggy forest, okay? To where you have two assumptions that you have to make. Uh, the first is that the cryptography itself is right, right? It, 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 that it's going to stand the test of time, and the only thing that allows it to stand the test of time is time itself, right? Yeah. You can't cheat that. When it comes to those type of like mathematical theorems, they're going to be challenged and, you know, it could be exploited or, you know, figured out that there's a problem with it a decade from now. Um, just due to the complexity, the second part, uh, which is even more challenging sometimes, is that the actual, let's say the math itself is good, holds up, right? How is it implemented? How is it actually coded? Uh, that creates like a second point of failure. So, you know, why is Ergo conservative and uses older Sigma protocols? Because number one, they're, you know, they have time that uh, we can basically have pretty strong assumptions that they're solid. And that because they've been around long enough, the uh, knowledge in terms of implementation uh, is there. So, you know, that that's two factors that uh, we've considered, but, you know, seeing uh, zero knowledge uh, you know, advance, I think is a great thing. I just think it doesn't make sense. It's like the base layer of a chain because all of the value uh, is subject mm. to that one thing. Like as a roll-up solution, sure, I'd be happy to see uh, people playing with zero knowledge on Ergo, but for the base chain itself, that's kind of like the uh, bottom of the ship, so to speak. You might You might not want to do any major repairs there because it supports everything yeah mm -hmm. are you also, um, um oh sorry now go ahead uh mine's a tangent so if you've got a relevant question go ahead i was just going to touch on the uh um the regulation side of that as well being a privacy only coin and being able to sort of put that blanket over all privacy coins and and regulate them in a certain um, aspect whereas uh, the differentiator with ergo is it's optional um it's it's at the application layer yeah, yeah. And, and i was just going to say knowing some of the privacy communities out there all i can say is good luck <laughs> yeah exactly right yeah i wanted to bring up uh monero and the, i i know monero is kind of the probably the best well-known privacy coin I don't really know much about it. And I, I just wanted to know, like, do you guys know much about how it works? Like, like what its protocol is, like how? Sure, it, 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 it kind of, most privacy coins use basically the same uh, tactic other than, you know, some of the newer zero knowledge stuff. And that is you get a set of actors and then you use the group of actors to obfuscate who does what. Right. Similar to the mixer. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like every transaction is mixed. And, uh, you know, so, you know, it, there's a variety of schemes, uh, you know, the Monero, you know, they have a certain set per transaction that you it's one of these people, right? And then it mm -hmm. becomes more complex with time. Um, you then you have like, uh, pirate is a good example. I think they have like a million stealth addresses now that wow. you know seeing that is is looking at that in in terms of like a linear blockchain transaction it's just a fish line that's a ball basically 
It's incredible. Yeah. So, you know, in, in terms of like, uh, stopping those communities, good luck. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know there's been some chatter about, uh, unmixing mixed transactions on things like, um, tornado cash and like, uh, protocols like that. Um, it, it seems like, uh, you know, the trade-off between having the protocol be very usable and very private is kind of something you have to weigh. Yeah, and, and custodial mixers are sketchy. Yeah, that's like, true. They're, they, they're, they have a history of, you know, I'm going to send my coins to CW Tornado and he's going to do something and then nothing happens and he's gone. <laughs> right? <Thank God. laughs> yeah, because, you know, you're giving custody uh of of your uh coins tokens whatever to whoever that custodial mixer is so actually having it enforced via calculator uh instead of like a third party uh is is a huge benefit yeah and i've even read about uh custodial mixers um like when law enforcement gets involved like they'll cooperate with law enforcement like what (laughs) what's the point (laughs) you know like not to say that mixing has to be about breaking laws, but no, if, it's a good point. If 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 your mixing protocol is going to just hand over what's being done, like why even use it in the first place? It's absolutely ridiculous. But that's the thing as well. Like it, what we mentioned before, your right to privacy, and uh, why should I have that right if I'm not doing anything wrong? So if you know what I mean, like. They might have some phony sort of warrant that I've been doing something dodgy and um, they just want to look into my records and then I'll, um, custodial mixer A wants to hand over or has to hand over that sort of information. Like I think that's yeah, really crazy. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's fascinating to me because people uh, that interact with these blockchain networks do so voluntarily, right? It's a voluntary choice. It's a voluntary economic choice. And then you have uh, societies, groups that have mismanaged the shit out of their financial situation. And then they have people that are trying to opt out. Like they're trying to make a voluntary choice to, you know, perhaps secure their own financial future, use better financial tools, you know, not be a part of uh, the madness that they didn't create. They just inherited because they're a citizen of a certain society. And then that, uh, you know, government says, okay, what we need to do is we need to sink the lifeboats. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. Yeah. And uh, we've seen what happens in regards to the custodial sort of side of things in the last month or two um, in the whole crypto space. So I think having that non-custodial side as well from from the ergo perspective with the mix, I think that's massive. Yeah, see, the, the people in the world that benefit the most from this technology are the people in the ones that, uh, you know, they don't have financial order or and or stability in their society. And privacy protects them. Like, uh, you know, if you have some people that are in a jurisdiction where the government is, you know, perhaps it's even illegal to participate in these networks to where it's punishable by, you know, X. Yeah, I mm-hmm. want those users to have privacy. And, uh, you know, if a first world government has a problem with that, that's their problem. You know, just make it open code, put it to where people can run it in their own space. And uh, then it becomes unstoppable. It's once we get rid of looking at the first principles of respecting people's space, allowing local computation with clear trust assumptions that we create all kinds of madness that uh, continually plague our industry. I think that's very well said, mate. Very, very well said. Um, just goes against all the, that, uh, well, even the term that Noah mentioned earlier, the weaponization of money. Just, uh, yeah, very, very well put. Mm-hmm. Any last words, gents? We've been going for about 40, 45 minutes or so now. Um, do you want to wrap things up at this stage? Sure. I, I would say that uh, the point, in my opinion, of, of this technology is to give people the opportunity to interact with a system where the assumptions of control are known. And privacy is increasingly uh, 
I, I would say one of the most critical issues in terms of understanding what the assumptions of control even are in life. So it's something everybody should take time to really think about, you know, what they're revealing and why and to who and for what purpose. Because ultimately, if you want a happy life, protect your space, like set up a healthy space for yourself, have healthy people in it. And, uh, you know, don't bring in actors that are going to abuse that. Yep. Yeah, I Most think it's definitely. the easiest thing to uh, just spout the, uh, I don't have anything to worry about, so I don't need to think about it. But you should think about it. And you should think about what could happen if you don't have privacy and challenge your assumptions about, you know, your day-to-day -day life if you live in a place like a first world country where you don't have to think about it. Yeah, most definitely. Uh, so I hope you enjoyed this uh, wonderful discussion on privacy. It's a very, very broad topic. So I think we could be going on for a number of episodes on this one. Um, hope you enjoyed it. I hope it's a little bit insightful as well. So take care, guys. Thanks for tuning in uh, for another Hash It Out. Thanks, gentlemen, for uh, having the discussion. Cheers. Cheers. Yeah, thanks, guys.